And welcome to the DS Smith stage. Um, it's very nice to have you here again, or to have you here for the first time. Um, next up as a speaker, we have Miro Martinek, the CEO of Mobile24. And just uh, some background to Miro. Um, he's always been a software a code developer from a very young age. So after graduating from Harvard, um, he held multiple management positions at companies, for example, like HomeAway, Advico, or Home24. And then in 2015, Miro, after having noticed that the furniture um, market was lagging behind in terms of the e-commerce space, um, co-founded X24 Factories um, with the goal or with the aim to make furniture online shopping more fun. And um, he's going to tell, uh, talk to you about um, AI or artificial intelligence in the fern tech space. And yeah, I hope you enjoy it and give him a warm welcome. Thank you, Till. Big pleasure to be here. And I'm very excited to see again so many people who are eager to learn about AI, who are already applying, applying AI. So um, this is supposed to be a little bit of my personal view of what I've seen in the last couple of years, what's happening in the space, and how, touch it, how does it touch e-commerce, and what are the potential applications. So if you're a super geek, uh, you might be excited. There's some uh, geeky slides at the end of this. But I'm trying to give it a soft start. A little bit about myself, thank you for the little introduction. My name is Miro Morzenek, I'm CEO of the X24 Factory. X24 Factory was founded here in Berlin uh, like three years ago. We are operating online furniture showrooms um, that are aggregating something like three and a half, four million various products from different vendors. And um, our core focus is extracting product information, understanding the product, um, and then applying it in a way that the user finds the products you like. Um, so a lot of that is about product data management, um, ranking, analysis. And so because all we do is furniture, we call ourselves 100% Ferntech. What's the, what's the status of AI today? And when you look at this, sorry, when you look at this, like this is something that's uh, you know, a company called Gardner put into uh, place. It basically represents what they call a, 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 a hype cycle. Um, I call it an announcement cycle because what's interesting, back to like 20 years ago, I developed some code and that actually was machine learning in a way. I mean, it all started in the 50s, last century, Alan Turing building stuff up. Um, the first bunch of applications were from a scientific nature. I developed code that was based on, you know, focused on image recognition for scientific applications. And then what I felt was stuff was leveling off. The attention was leveling off. There was no real industrial application yet. Um, however, it got a bit of a renaissance that's like 10 years ago. And that was really because people, you know, e-commerce took off. Um, lots of products were certainly available for purchase. People wanted to research that, and it, didn't, it wasn't scalable anymore. You know, finding the right products, sorting the right products, making them available, um, identifying the characteristics. So the editorial approaches of the past didn't seem to work as much. Yeah? So all of a sudden, you had to basically bring in algorithmic approaches to the game to make it much more scalable. And right now, Gardner says we're at the top, the deep learning, machine learning is at the peak of the hype cycle. Um, what I think is interesting, like, you know, the last three or four years, I noticed everybody in e-commerce is concerned about AI and machine learning. And then you ask me, like, but what is it? Like, this is the core of your business. And some people might say, well, you know, we're doing a little bit of email marketing and they have some components that are AI related. So yeah, we don't really have to deploy data science so much. But everybody looking forward to eventually um, bringing the applications together. And so what you see basically at the beginning of the cycle is the development of infrastructure tools. That is hardware because AI is very processing intense and software components, libraries and algorithms. That you don't have to develop everything from the scratch. And in the last four years, you had basically the establishment of the second stage, like software tools. And the software tools are what are allowing you to now efficiently bring together and uh, develop a few actual applications and deploy those applications in a, uh, so you don't have to bet the entire house. 
And then eventually, and I think that's what Gardner refers to looking forward, there'll be much more holistic applications. And I want to give you a little bit of a, the current status of what this looks like. When you look at the general e-commerce um, use cases, like one of the core use cases is product ranking, like really presenting products that are highly relevant to your users. Um, based on that, you can build relationships between those products. Um, you can drive recommendations to your users. Another one is user ranking or user segmentation. It's like by, the, by methods of deep learning, understanding and categorizing the users and then offering them products. Yeah, so what we call personalization. Not a good one I've seen coming up recently is dynamic pricing. You know, it's like with, with super distributed catalogs, um, you, don't, you actually want to be very smart about like where to feature which product at what price. But it's really like hard to do this in an you know, editorial fashion. You really have to do this in an automated fashion. So that's a good one. Free text search. You know, you look at the juggernauts, obviously Google has technology, Amazon deploys thousands of engineers on this, um, but how about the average e-commerce store that maybe uses shop um, software components? Um, the standard search features, they don't do it anymore if you run large catalogs. So free text search, query analysis, that is something which is really at the core of those new tools. Image recognition, image search, that is basically brand new now in e-commerce. It's like inexistent and applied successfully for the last two years, I would say. And that's really because now there's tools out there. Um, because that really requires in-depth algorithmic knowledge, but also processing power. And there's some really cool things you can do with that. But as you can imagine, understanding just from a piece of data what this product is about, what the features are, helps you much better to actually drive a user to a specific product. Yeah, if you're only looking for green shoes, but you're not even capable of delivering, you know, like a specific uh, color of green, you can distinguish this. It's hard to tell, you know, to tell a user, here's the perfect assortment for what you're looking for. And then last but not least, language processing, chatbots, Amazon Echo is like just building an infrastructure, you know, of, of, of little devices. Um, Amazon considers this at the core of the distribution. Um, and eventually, you as a shop will have to connect and leverage those technologies. So that's general, gener general e-commerce. And when you look at marketplaces, you have like additionally the problem that you don't, you're not in control of the product information you get. Um, you get a lot from marketplace partners who actually have most of the time also trouble to deliver good product uh, uh, data quality. And so data quality management, but also shop ranking is an important application right now because you want to use user signals to determine how important is this shop, you know, amongst all the other shops, yeah? Um, and there's, there's, you have the users decide, yeah? Amazon does it quite well. Um, other marketplaces are catching up. What are the key benefits? Why should you, as a, you know, from a business perspective, really worry about it? Um, I think like the main benefit is personalization. And personalization to me is really driving higher product relevancy. And as, of course, if you drive more important product, the more relevant product to your users, the likelihood that they'll purchase just goes up. So of course, your marketing efficiency goes up. Your acquisition cost goes down. Um, if you, are, you know, re, uh, create higher offer relevancy, right time, right place, right offer, right promotion, um, that obviously also drives at that conversion rate. Yeah? So you have to understand the user, you deliver him the right products at the right price. And obviously, if you, if you really understand what the user is looking for, um, out of an endless space of keywords, um, but if, you, know, you know this from other user signals, and you can, through collaborative filtering or some other approaches, you can basically like, tie two users together and you understand what they're looking for. Again, you're able to serve him better products. So personalization is really one of the key advantages. And the other, the second big one to me is basically automation. And by automation, I mean in a very important one, which is recognizing and understanding your products. So what we call product data recognition. 
And if you recognize the real features of a product, and not just talking color, of course, but in furniture, for instance, is very complicated products. You know, you, you have 800 different categories, and a sofa is, is very different from a mattress or from a curtain or from a carpet. So you have an endless space of attributes, um, and there's no EAN code, so there's no way to connect two products with each other. You actually have to understand the product. Um, but if you're able to do that, then you give users the better opportunity to find your products, to filter the products, to sort the products in a meaningful fashion. And that's what high intent users do. If you just feature them, you know, an inspirational catalog and you leave the research work for, to them, you just have like you're leaving off a lot of money on the table. You know? And the second thing of what you can do once you understand the catalog and you can put products into relation with each other, you can really create relationships you can upsell, you have related products, you know that products are similar or comparable. So again, this is really what's relevant to the users. And there is no way, it's from my understanding, other than some companies which, very, you know, which deploy very uh, highly editorial manual approaches, um, you know, with batteries of, uh, you know, you know crowdsourced, um, to do this in a very scalable fashion over lots of lots of inventory and assortment. So when you look at it from the outside, the state of like what are the, the two core benefits, personalization and automation for product data recognition. Now, there's also some challenges. And the obvious one you ask yourself is, hmm, well, this all sounds good, but um, I've never really seen anybody really be passionate about it. And there's a reason for it. To really do AI and machine learning, sometimes you will have to bet the house on it. Sometimes the core requirement in order to do it right, you literally have to have gigabytes of data. Because without data, machine learning really doesn't make a ton of sense. You know? And that relates to product data, visitor data, transactional data, you, any type of user signals you can process. And not only that, you also have to have good training data. Because remember, it's about deep learning. So if you really want to deploy that, there is a, a quite an intense process and depending on how complex the products are, it can be more or less and take mo uh, long, um, you have to produce training data and you keep up the quality of your training data. And that's a big requirement. And when, whenever you talk to a very good AI guy, he'll tell you there's something you should understand, AI patience. AI patience means if you are trying to, if you have a linear approach to producing data, and you compare this to a dynamic AI approach, just to reach the quality level and accuracy level, that'll just take time, you know, for the learning approach to match the linear approach. And that's painful because like you keep investing, you keep building the assets, but over, you know, only over time you see like it will overtake and the accuracy goes up and you will really reap the benefits of automation there. Um, and that's what any AI guy will tell you is you need that AI patience. And secondly, of, all, of course, as well, you need people who understand it. Like you need uh, the algorithmic developers, you need AI supporters, data miners, you need data scientists, you need guys who really produce training data, editing teams, crowds, um, all of that, and processes to, al to align that. So that's a whole lot of things you have to take care of and you need money and time. But all is not last. The good news is, E-commerce gets more and more competitive, so there's more and more similarity between catalogs, user types, and, and use cases. And for those, with, when you're using certain vendors, they have pre-trained models for your user base, for your catalog base, for your, you know, so you can just rely on. So if you don't need a ton of flexibility, um, there, there is that, there is those software tools. I'm gonna explain a little bit about what that is. And here comes the interesting part, how to AI. That's almost as geeky as it gets, but like there's a ton of things you can, you can deploy these days. First the decision is, do you want, do you consider AI and artificial lear uh, machine learning um, a core of your business? Does it really drive a competitive advantage for you? Um, do you really worry in the long run that you, you know, will be on top of, you know, like producing personalized catalogs and user interaction, then you really have to do it yourself. And we I'll tell you what this can look like. If you think, I need results fast, 
I don't want to bet the house on it. Um, I really like it, but hey, this is not core of my business. Um, then you should really rely on software tools, right? So let's start with how this cocktail can look like if you want to do it yourself. No worries, this is as geeky as it gets, and it's, it's hard to read, but I guess like, you can download it later. I call it infrastructure tools. And the infrastructure tools, like, you know, do I need guys who understand AI languages, programming languages? You know, let's say Scala for big data management, R or Python, more like from, um, you know, statistical uh, perspective, like or BI languages. Second of all, really important, you need guys who fully are, uh, you know, have full scope and understanding of data science libraries. You need libraries for deep learning. TensorFlow was co-developed by Google. So some of these platforms actually open source their, uh, their libraries. Um, you need high performance data calculation libraries. You need um, data visualization libraries. So this is really geeky. Um, but if you want to do AI in-house, you really need to worry about that. And then there's a bunch of algorithms. And when you, you know, this is almost like a scientific approach. You need guys who understand how to deploy certain algorithms, you know, like skip gram, sequence to sequence, like some search um, layers, software layers, they already have a little bit of learning kits and such uh, included. Um, so you need guys who understand that. And here comes the good news. You already have the big guys, Amazon, Google, uh, Microsoft, Azure, or even Facebook opening up their platform and enabling tools and services that you can build on and just integrate. And the, other, the good news next to having them do the hard work is also that they can basically bring the scale to the table so that you can do it in a very cost efficient manner. Yeah? So when you look at Amazon, um, you know, AWS, uh, image recognition services, deep lens for video recognition, speech recognition, or even Amazon Translate, Amazon is pushing this pretty hard for, um, for the Echo deployment. Google Cloud, also natural language processing, Vision Cloud for image recognition services. Um, the Google Talk bot, uh, you know, is part of that suite. Or even like a player that you haven't come across in terms of, you know, deep learning is so much, but they really have some very interesting tools as Microsoft, the Azure suite um, with a machine learning studio, or even Facebook provides certain API services for connecting the bot infrastructure. And last but not least, um, if you really want to do this on a high scale, then you also need to work a little bit with the hardware vendors. I used to work a long time ago at uh, NVIDIA in Silicon Valley, and back then these guys were known for gaming, high-end gaming machines. Um, as of late, lately, they've done AI, and they're renting out you know, high, you know, high processing capacity for like $3,500 an hour. So if you really think you got a lot of data to process, um, that's something really cool. But if you think, a, well, the in-house thing sounds a little bit complicated. I'm not sure how passionate I am about this entire thing. Then really, there's a catalog of software tools. And remember, like this was the next step in the evolution that you can think about. And I think that's really meaningful. And this is just a small excerpt of what's out there. But I would categorize it in four different areas. There's a, a, you know, a, a, an, an array of vendors um, specialized in image recognition, you know, Clarify, vSense. Some of them have already are industry specific, focused on fashion products, others are more on consumer electronics and so on. Um, you know, some, some great companies. You have um, a second cluster in marketing personalization. It's really about campaign personalization. And like the aforementioned CRM vendors or retargeting technology vendors, they leverage user signals to learn you know, what type of products they push out to the user, again, to create a higher um, product relevancy. But not only in the marketing side, also on-site, that's when you really start worrying about it and when you can really drive the money in. Um, if you personalize smartly on-site, there's an array of tools, sentient on the search, um, or um, you know, automated A-B testing, um, Qubit on you know, personalized promotions, Prutzes as a recommendation engine provider actually based out of Germany. Um, you know, there's an array of these guys and tools that you can integrate and deploy fairly easily because they have pre-trained models. Um, and as of lately, 
on-site search tools are really important and they're really hitting the market right now very strongly. You know, you have vendors that have always been in this space, like Fact Finder, um, but then you have more industry-specific ones like Twiggle coming up, as things in a US company, or Big Data for Travel that are either then focused on fashion or on travel products and such. And I think if you, if you think, hey, I really want to want to get behind this and I want to train my team, you know, and I want to get experience with it and I also want quick results. I think if you pick any one of these, um, you know, try them out, the worst that can happen to you is basically that the more data and the more intense pro algorithms you want to run, the more they'll charge you. But that's about as bad as it gets, but nothing compares to trying to do it yourself over 10 years and then figure out it's not the right thing for you. So. I'll leave you with this, and basically, that is it. If you feel as passionate as we do about AI and the application thereof and e-commerce, um, you know, we're happy to get to know you. Best way to reach us is an email address. I'll leave this for you, and um, Jess here will probably will be very eager to get to know um, any interested party. Hope you join the passion. Thank you very much. Hello. OK, wonderful. Now it works. Uh, thank you very much for that very uh, interesting talk about AI in the Ferntech, uh, Miro. And now is, we still have some time for a question and answer session. Um, so if there's anyone here or anybody here who has a question, Okay, wonderful. Thanks. Uh, so just a question on where you apply AI. How much do you actually take the, the sh data on a shop as a given and then do analytics based on that? And how much do you actually process data that's coming in from suppliers, content providers, and so on to get the most out of this data and transform it, actually? Yeah, good question. If I understand the question correctly, it's really about um, to what extent can you rely on third parties already to sort of provide data in a structured fashion? Um, I think it really depends on the industry. Uh, like there's certain, like when you, when you look consumer electronics or products that are not as complex, you already get a decent amount of tools um, and vendors who are providing you with structured data, which is good enough for most use cases. The more complex a product gets and the more variety you have in the catalog, Boy, you can spend a lot of time doing it yourself, <laughs> you know, and the data gets really dirty and messy. Um, and furniture, as an example, it's crazy. Like, you know, furniture gets sourced in somewhere in Southeast Asia and one of four or 5,000 fabs in, in Shenzhen, and it get, you know, some guy takes a picture and then they, you know, produce a data sheet and it gets translated into 20 languages. Some purchasing agent picks it up and so it gets really, very messy. So if you're in a bad industry or in a complicated industry, you still have to spend a lot of time. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Yeah. I got a question about the nature of the data. Is it more textual data or numbers? How does this balance go in your processes? So if I understand the question correctly, it's really like, you know, where do you put the um, attention to actually recognizing attributes? Yeah. I think like the, the easiest one, if it's textual information, if it's there, it's obviously easy to easier to process. Um, but here comes the but. If you really dependent on who had created the data, it makes sense or not, you know? So then you like, and, and I, I know some vendors with 200,000, 300,000 products, they don't even know the material of about 40% of the catalog. And like, guys, how can this be? You know, this is, you know, this is substantial revenue. You're leaving this on the table. You're leaving out the high intense users for this. And then the question is, so our approach in that regard is, yes, we build sensors are trying still to extract it and with a higher likelihood to identify what would be the right one, yeah? But so if you're stuck with nothing, it's, it's, it's tough, yeah? If you have something, it's easier. If you have something that's really already accurate and you have, you know, if you have a small catalog and you can be sure that the quality of the data is good, 
um, then you know it's, it's really not that hard, obviously. Yeah? And then you can really, coming back to your question, deploy tools that are extracting that. When it comes to image, you'd be surprised there are some good vendors um, out there right now, and they deliver a lot of uh, you know, great patterns, depending on the industry. I can tell you, like, shirt, you know, neck sizes, neck shapes, uh, all of this, um, with a fairly high accuracy level. Yeah. So um, yeah, don't underestimate what's possible there. All right. Do we have somebody else who has a question? If not, I have one. Um, mm -hmm. And so you talked a lot about the potential um, applications of AI in Ferntech. Um, now, I would be very interested, um, what other um, sectors or industries, especially in the e-commerce space, do you see having or being ripe for disruption, having a great way AI could have the biggest impact? In e-commerce? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in e-commerce, you're, you're looking at basically anything where there's a large variety um, of, of products. So like, you know, literally, I'm not sure whether they're in selling cars online, but it is what justifies because you only have a limited, you know, selection. And yes, there's lots of lots of attributes, but ultimately not so many products, right? So um, I think, you know, the personal, you know, the, the attention will much more focus on the user interaction and identifying the user and personalizing that, yeah? Um, it's a hard pick if you ask me, you know, there's obviously lots of categories just, just be being built up. I think travel still has a lot of opportunity and the category is so big already. Um, understanding what users liked about their hotel experience, for instance, that could be an interesting one. All right, thank you. Um, so if there's, okay, one more question. I, you mentioned some of these big players like Google, Amazon. Um, Considering the business you are in, like a furniture type of business, uh, do you think a kind of uh, general purpose engines uh, will fit your, let's say, a complicated, let's say, <laughs> commerce business? I mean, some of the business very easy. Some of the business you say the furniture is not that easy. Yeah. So out of off the shelf uh, recognition of uh, complex, uh, let's say, name of uh, attributes, it may be a challenge. So are you using any of these big players or? Or you are probably also looking for more, let's say, a um, smaller company can probably personalize the kind of uh, uh, task you need to for your business? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question. Whether we are using them, I think whenever we need, we have um, resource intense applications, we like to use some of the infrastructure tools out there. Because processing power is really something that the big guys are much better at. Right, managing that efficiently. When it comes to the algorithmic approaches, for us that's core, right? So because we maintain very large catalogs and very inhomogeneous um, categories, right? Um, will the big guys focus on it? I think you know the big guys have much more of a generalistic approach, right? Um, and they will sharpen the tools and the applicability of those software tools and components. Yeah? But you still have to plug it together. Yeah? And then eventually you have these industry vertical tool vendors. And I think depending on what industry you're in, you're probably better off with sticking with one of these guys you know, to experiment in initial stages. But I can guarantee you at one point you will be better off doing it all yourself, right? If the business scales, um, it becomes too specific. You want more flexibility. All right. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, time is running out. So thank you very much again for this um, session. Enjoy your conference. Thank you.